Um, our classes are recorded in here, so you can go back and watch Monday's class on YouTube. All right. Um, have, are you familiar with Angel, our course management system? No. Okay. Uh, after class, let, let's let's talk about that because uh, that's how you can log on and see the assignments and see the course materials uh, and so on. Uh, as I mentioned, um, I'm having trouble with this machine. Um, if this keeps up, I might uh, just bring my machine in from home, my laptop, and, and do that because I don't feel like wrestling with this every week. All right. Um, last time we we went over the the course materials and the structure of the course and all that. A lot of that information you can get from Angel or from the video. Um, the the other big part uh, of last time was discussing like kind of like um, discussing two things, I suppose. One of them was just kind of uh, comparing and contrasting developing apps for mobile versus developing mobile enabled websites. All right. The second thing we did is we discussed the development environment. Um, and that is covered um, in chapter one, I believe, in the textbook. So in addition to um, the video and the recording, if you can set up, do you have the development uh, environment set up already? Okay. All right. Well, then, then you're in good shape. All right. Um, what we're going to do today is we are going to do a little bit of a review on some of the concepts um, that you probably already know, but just to sort of make sure um, we're familiar with them. In addition, we're going to cover a little more... Uh, uh, background information um, concerning um, concerning the uh, the uh, um, Android environment. All right. Uh, the textbook shows uh, in chapter one, it discusses uh, different um, versions of the operating system and what features are uh, uh, available in it. Um, the details of that aren't really critical. Um, probably the, the most important thing is to sort of read through those to get a sense of the sorts of things that get updated between versions. All right. If you notice, um, many of them relate to um, Many of them relate to bug fixes and relate to integrating with other applications um, and, and so on. So just sort of read through that to get a sense of all the different uh, things and, and uh, the, the capabilities uh, of that. What I'd like to do is, um, you obviously have, do you have an Android device? Um, or do you use the emulator? Okay. All right. And you said you were, you were looking at getting one? Yeah, I think I Okay. Yeah. No, no. You, you you don't have to. I have I have some Android uh, devices, and in a, you know you can do a lot of your development on the emulator, and then you can um, you can um, uh, you know use in lab. You can use the Android devices that I have. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually have several of them. Um, I have um, um, several of these these medium size uh, Galaxy tabs. I also have a couple no contract phones, and I have some bigger ones. So we can get a sense of, of how it works in in all those different environments. All right. This is a this is a, a, a Samsung Galaxy tab. Which you know could mean that uh, the Apple police are going to storm, uh, the, you know, any any minute now and and, and wrestle it away from me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I suppose. All right. Yeah, exactly.
All right. Um, but to show a little tour of what some of the capabilities are, one thing that is is a little bit, uh, I won't say it's difficult, but it's not quite as seamless as it is uh, in the Apple world, given that um, each manufacturer has its own little quirks and add-ons and stuff like that as far as the Android device. Uh, but we'll take a quick tour of it, and we'll talk specifically of in development mode. We can see that. A little swipe is what um, clears it. Here's the main screen. Um, there are icons for different apps that came um, downloaded. You know, so we have a web browser which uh, is connected to the wireless network here. Again, this would be a similar situation that you would have where you don't have a phone with a contract, so you, know, so you can't you know, be driving around uh, listening, you know, listening to uh, an internet station or whatever. But you, you would have the capability to hook to a wireless network. Um, there, there's typically only a handful of buttons on these. Um, there's a back button, there's a menu button, there's a home button, and there's a search. So typically that's all they have. Now those might be a little different uh, depending on the specific device. This is a Motorola phone. Well, actually it has the same buttons. So this part of it acts the same. All right. But as you notice, the icons on the bottom are a little bit different um, than here. The one thing that drives me crazy about this one is the list of applications are oriented horizontally as opposed to vertically. So if you see me going like this and nothing's happening, it's because I forget that these are oriented horizontally instead of vertically. Uh, I don't know. Well, if you well, no, if you flip it, it, it will be. I well, no, it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, it does, but it's still scrolling horizontally. So it isn't, it isn't the fact the way that it's oriented that's bothering me, it's the fact that the way it scrolls. Because most of the ones I've used scroll vertically. And anyhow, we're going to look at the settings, all right, and, and make some important, uh, or, or look at some, uh, look at some of the, the capabilities relevant to development in the settings. First of all, and again, these are sometimes in slightly different places and different devices, but all Android devices like have these settings somewhere. All right. Yeah, the, these are device-wide settings, yeah. In, in addition, there, are, there can be settings for specific things. Here's sound settings, display settings that you can see. Again, you can hit the back to go backwards. Um, application settings. First of all, that top one says, might be a little hard to read, but the top one says allow un, uh, applications from unknown sources. Um, in other words, this is like a security thing, whereas if this isn't checked, you can only, you can only um, um, install applications that are signed and come from the Android store and so on and so forth. As a developer, though, we don't necessarily want that checked. Oh, I'm sorry, we, we don't want that, that uh, procedure done. We want to be able to check all right, and, uh, and install our applications. Therefore, we want this checkbox checked all right, to allow from unknown. The other thing that we need to do is and where was that? Ah, never mind. I'm wrong. Under development, set options for application development. We want to enable USB um, debugging and allow mock locations and have those set. Again, those are things that, um, because we're using this in development mode, we want to have set. So, 
enable USB debugging and allow uh, unsigned applications uh, are the two big ones that we, you want to be able to do on the device so that you can uh, go and do this. It was under apps, and it was under development setting. Yeah. Now my machine, my uh, my phone, which is a Motorola, um, it's in a slightly different place. The application setting to allow from non-market applications is set there, but the USB one is stored elsewhere. I believe. Well, maybe not. This is where, in one respect, um, the, uh, the, the, the Android uh, environment, being that it is um, less standardized than, than the, the Apple environment, uh, is challenging. And it's challenging both for the users and for the developers. You know, there's so many more devices that it can run on, and there's so many different versions of the operating system, whereas uh, the, the, in the Apple world, there's only a handful of devices, handful of versions of the operating system. I want to go and install an application on here, just to go through the process. With this small group of people, it probably would be better just for me to like stand up and, and, and show this. Um, I'm going to go to the Android market, hit home, go to the Android market, and click the Play Store. Continue. I accept that. And then we can look for um, applications to install. All right. Um, really, that was a big, uh, big thing why, why uh, Apple got off to such a quick start. They were the first, and they had a very solid set of applications. One nice thing about it in the Android environment is there's a, lot of, there's a lot more free stuff because people are trying to get an inroad uh, in there. All right. I'm going to... Search for um, a task manager, a task killer, which is something that um, I don't know if it's as essential now, but when I got my first Android, they said this should be the first application that you download, all right? Because apps in a mobile environment like, hang around even when you don't think they're being used, all right? When you close out of an app, a lot of times it's running just sort of in the background. So I'm going to go and I'm going to install that. And the one thing that I want to show you is when I go to install that, notice it gives me and it defines a set of permissions that it is asking for. It's telling, it's telling me that the app want, it might want to do some of these things. And that way I'm very clear about what the app's capabilities are. So that's sort of a very nice security feature. And then if I say, yeah, that's okay, I can then accept and download. And it will go through the process and download and install the app. Some apps you can configure even to be um, automatically updated in case there's updates. Um, if not, if you go to the applications, it will typically show you with a little tick mark or something that that application um, can be uh, updated. I'm going to click open just for the heck of it. Yeah, uh, it's called Advanced Task Killer Free. All right. Here is, for example, the apps that are running currently. Even though I like turned it on like. 
10 minutes ago. <laughs> All right, there's a lot of apps going in. So occasionally you have issues with performance or memory usage or something like that. That's why it's good to have that application task manager. And you can go in and you can clobber them and kill them. And then when you look again, you'll notice that only a couple things are going. The task manager itself or the task killer and uh, the Google Play Store. Now, do you remember from last time where the application's permissions are defined? They're defined in a specific file. Do we recall what that file was? That was, pardon me? Manifest. Yeah, it, it, it is recorded in the, in the application manifest. So you put in there that, and then that is what prompts the user when they go to install it, that it might do these certain things. If you have code that tries to do those things, and, it's not, and that permission isn't in the app, uh, the app's manifest, it, it won't let you do it. So that's a nice little sort of security thing. Um, whether people indeed read those, just like whether people read the license agreements when they install softwares on their PC is another matter. But at the very least, you know, you are warned what this application could potentially do. All right. Uh-huh. No. That's, that's something that the developer creates and is used in the installation procedure. Right. That's what, that's what drives when you're going and installing it, the list of things that it's going to do. Absolutely. In this, you, in other things you can specify, ah, shoot. This needs updated. It has an, an earlier version of that. I was going to try and run an application that would show up on the device. Um, because right, firing up the emulator is really slow on this. Again, I, I apologize. That's something that, that we'll make sure is addressed for, um, for future classes. All right. What I'd like to do now is review some object-oriented um, terminology. Um, and, and talk a little bit about, uh, you know, in, in terms of Java and in terms of XML to make sure that we're all uh, on the same page as far as that goes. All right. Um,
delete this and I will import another application. First of all, um, and again, I know that you have all done some Java, so my hope is that this largely will be uh, a review. Um, so let, let's go around and, and I'll just shout out a concept um, or idea and, and someone can define um, what that is. Um, what is, someone define what a class is. Very good. Okay. Anyone want to add to that? Well, let me ask this question. What's the difference between a class and an object? Okay. What, what's another way to say instantiation? A created version. An instance, a created version, a specific version. You know, um, again, you know, uh, you, we can talk about a book, and we could create a book class, and the book class would have stuff in it that is true about all books. It would be sort of a template, as was said, or a blueprint for any book in the abstract sense. An instance of it would be an object, and that might be like this book. All right. Now, what do objects, I'm sorry, what do classes consist of? What is a class made up of? It has data, it has methods, or okay. Right. It, ha it has data and methods. And, and there, there's a lot of synonymous terms that people use. Sometimes they'll use the term attributes. Uh, sometimes they'll use the term instance variables, um, and for methods, functions, or behaviors. Uh, what our Java textbook says that we use in the Java class says that an object knows things and can do things. All right, and I think that's a good summary. All right, attributes would be some things like the characteristic uh, of a book, um, like the title like the author, like the date it was published, how many pages, the kind of binding, and all that. These are called instance variables because each member of this class then, each object created from it, has some specific values for those variables. So, you know, if we made a person class, every person has a height, a weight, a birth date, and so on down the line. That's something every, uh, every member of that class has. Every instance has its own values for it, and therefore they're called instance variables. Um, methods, then, um, are things that the object or, or class can do. A book, for example, could be checked out of a library. A book could be returned to a library. A book could be purchased. A book could be sold. All the different things that a book can do um, are the different methods um, in, in doing that. Um, what are primitives? <coughs> that may be an example of a primitive, but... Um, okay. Um, what's the implication, uh, and that, that's correct, the primitives are, as the name implies, sort of simple data types, all right? Whereas if we talk about a book, a book's a complex data type, right? Because there's a lot of attributes about a book, or there potentially could be a lot of attributes about a book, and there can be behaviors for it. If we talk about a data type as being like an integer, all right, what are the attributes of an integer? Well, the integer, <laughs> right? That, that's all there is. It's simple. A Boolean would be another example of it. Boolean's true or false. There's no other properties that you could associate with a Boolean. All right? So those are primitives. What is the implication of whether something is an object uh, data type or a primitive? 
what is the implication of that? Any thoughts? An object's an instance of a class, right? But in terms of maybe the way it's stored, or the way it works when you're passing it as an argument, or things along those lines, what's the difference between? Okay. Right. Right. Um, objects, uh, object variables, object reference variables, um, use pointers, all right? Whereas primitives is the actual value. In other words, all right, if we were to do something like this, in a Java procedure, all right, when we're done, we'll have two integer variables and y will have a value of 0 and x will have a value of 1. All right? Because when we say x equals y, we're copying the value of that variable x into the variable y. All right? Which means that if we have the variable x in memory, we initialize it to 0. The variable y in memory, we initialize it to the value of x, so we copy that value over. If I say x equals 1, all right, it overwrites the value was there with 1, and y remains a value of 0. Because primitives, you store the value, the actual value, because it's primitive, it's simple. There's only one value. We can't take the same approach, though, with objects, because objects are complicated data types. There can be a lot of things associated with that. So instead, objects are created on the heap, all right, a heap of memory, all right, and they're referred to via object references, and those object references point to a particular object that was created. So if we were going to do a similar thing with our hypothetical book example, if I were to say, book x equals new book, book y equals new book, what that does is that creates on the heap two book objects that have all the properties of a book. And x, let's say, points to this one, holds a memory location where on the heap where that one lives, and y holds that one. So if we were to go in then and say x equal uh, or x dot set title Tale of Two Cities, then it would set the property in that object pointed to by X to Tale of Two Cities. If we then say Y equals X, what we are doing is we're pointing Y at the same object that x points to. So in all operations that deal with object references, we're manipulating the pointers. We're not manipulating the actual, quote, values of that. So now, y would point to this object as well. So if I were to say y dot set title, great expectations, then say system out print ln x dot get title, what would print out?
great expectations. All right. Why is that? Because when I execute this statement, x and y are pointing to the same object on the heap. So if I say y set title, I am setting the title both for, the, for, for that one object, the object that x points to and the object that y points to. And therefore, if I output that, is going to give me the value that I set it to, which is great expectations. What happens to this, by the way? What happens to this object? Yeah, it's out there until garbage collection. Uh, at this point here, nothing points to that. So it's gone from our perspective, and garbage collection will at some point get rid of it. And, and remove it from there. Nope. Nope, it's, it, it, you know, it, it's dead to you. <laughs> All right? Uh, yeah, you, 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 can't, you can't, like, repoint it. All right. Basically temporary memory. Yeah, in the, in the, yeah, depending on how efficient the Java virtual machine is at garbage collection, right. yeah, it would be, it would it would be a memory link, memory leak. All right. What can anyone tell me about public, private, and protected? What do those things mean? And someone give examples of when you would do one, when would you do the other? So private, private variables, uh, only the object instance of the class can see. Okay. Uh, public variable or method, anyone can see or use. Okay. Uh, but if it's protected, then inherited. Okay. All right. Very good. Exactly right. Something that is private is only available to members of the class on which it's defined. All right. So um, if I declare uh, something as private, then only objects, instances of that class can, can access it. If I declare it public, then anyone can access it. If I declare it protected, um, members of the class and any descendants can. Um, can uh, um, access that. All right. Um, how do we use those typically? What What are best practices as far as using those? Public, private, and protected. Okay. Can someone add to that or, or summarize that? Okay. Right. Right. Um, to kind of summarize that, um, attributes are typically going to be private or protected. All right. Um, methods, there's liable to be a mix of uh, public and uh, private or, or possibly protected. The idea is, it's a concept of data hiding. All right. We don't want the outside world to be able to get into the guts of our classes and objects. We don't want them to manipulate the, the attributes directly. Why don't we want them to be able to do that? Specific things to be done with it, such as, uh, say if it's a grand total, for instance. 
mm-hmm. or a uh, interest rate, you may want to have that calculated by your program and not manually manipulate. Right. All right. Other thoughts? Other? You want to control that access. Right. You want to control that access. So things such as maybe there's validation rules. Maybe um, a particular thing can only be uh, a value from 0 to 100, let's say. If you made that attribute private, I'm sorry, if you made that attribute public, then someone could say x dot attribute equals 200 and mess things up. Instead, if you make the attribute private and control access through a method then, then you can put code in there to throw exceptions if someone sets it. All right? So you want to control the manner in which people access it. Um, and, uh, and, and limit that. And you don't want them getting in. You know, another example is, let's say you were doing some, uh, something for a, uh, a, a plot of land that has a length and a width. All right? Maybe when they set the length and the width, you also calculate the perimeter and area. And you have an attribute for that. All right? The outside world shouldn't know about that. Should know that you're storing as an attribute the width, the length, and the, the perimeter and area. And it shouldn't be able to address those because it could go in, you could go in and set the width and the length and then set the perimeter to something that's wrong. You want control over that. So again, it's a control situation. You choose to expose, and they typically use that word, expose the properties that you want to be exposed through these uh, uh, public methods. And that way, again, it typically will be getters and setters, but they could be other things too, to do calculations or, or other sort of processes. Now, that doesn't mean that every method is, um, is, is going to be public. There might be, for example, some sort of calculation where there are some intermediate methods that you don't necessarily want someone to be able to jump in and, and run the senior intermediate method, maybe it's part of a process or whatever, in which case you can make that a private or protected uh, method uh, as well. All right? So uh, at any rate, um, the whole idea of this is, is controlling the integrity of that object and, and doing that by prohibiting people from getting in. And, and manipulating the guts of it. You know, it's like I, I use the analogy like with hardware, right? You know, if I want to plug in a keyboard here, I don't have to crack open the case and go and solder the wires from the keyboard on somewhere to the motherboard, right? That wouldn't be a good idea, all right? Instead, they provide me an interface, if you will. Uh, they, they expose that thing in a very controlled way. You know, this, there might be a USB plug on it that gets plugged into a USB port. So they've controlled that so I can only do it that way. And it's good because then I'm not blowing up motherboards by trying to, to, to wire a keyboard into them or, or anything like that. So there's control. It makes them more like components that you can plug in and you can have confidence that there's going to be integrity to that, uh, that component. All right? Um, what are constructors? Method that runs on the instantiation. Okay. So method that's used uh, when a class is uh, created. What cre oh, I'm sorry, when an object is created. Um, what creates an object? Yeah, it could be created there, but if I looked at a block of code, which ones are creating objects? Which statements are created on creating objects? Ones with the word new in them. All right. New says go and run the constructor. And there can be multiple constructors uh, for any, any given class. Um, why would you have more than one constructor to a class? Okay, and, and that, that's a, I love all these questions, all right? Um, let's, let's analyze what happens when you do that, all right? If I say book A, what have I done? 
I don't mean it that way. Like, what have I done? You know, what what actually has happened? I've created a pointer on the stack called A that points nowhere. Doesn't point to anything on the heap. All right, because the new is what creates that object on the heap. I've created a pointer, and that pointer I said at some point is going to point to a book object. But right now it doesn't point anywhere. So, later on, if I didn't do anything to create an object and I said a dot set title to something, what would happen? It would blow up. It would blow up with one of the famous null object reference pointer exception, right? Because this object reference doesn't point to anything on the heap. So is deliberately two steps because when you declare a variable th there, there's a difference between declaring a variable and creating an instance in Java uh, for object references uh, but not for integers. You know, with integers you, know, you create a variable and, and, and it has a value. Like if you create an int and don't give it a value I think it just has a value of zero. Um, because they're, they're, they're simple. You know, they don't take up a lot of space. With this, you have the ability to sort of control where you create and destroy these, uh, or create these uh, uh, objects on the heap. And this sets up the pointer, you know. I guess a way to say it is this sets up a pointer. The new is what actually adds it to the heap. So, in this statement, I could. This is legal. Because if I say book A, all right, I have a pointer called A, points to nothing. If I say book B equals new book, I create a pointer called B, whoops, that's what this part of it does, and I create a book object on the heap. That's what this does. If I say then, somewhere later on in the code, A equals B, alright, again, remember when I say a equals B, because these are object references, I'm dealing with the pointer. Alright, so when I say A equals B, I'm saying set the value of A to the value of B. The value of B is a pointer to this object, so now A also points to that object. Alright. Pardon me? Constructors, yes. Why would you have more than one constructor? Okay, you, you can have more than one constructors that way, but I'm, I'm talking about more than one constructor for a given class. You may have different parameters to, to throw out that you may have different parameters that you can create the object and initialize certain properties like in one swoop. Yeah, and then, yeah, the worst case scenario, or, or not the worst case, but you could also then have a default constructor that creates it and maybe default certain values. For example, I could have, getting back to my um, rectangle example, all right, I could have a constructor all right, that um, accepts a height and a width argument and then it will take those and it will set those instance variables to the parameters of the constructor. Or I could have a no argument constructor and in which case I could default maybe my 
default rectangle is a, you know, is a 5 by 10 or whatever in my particular situation. I, I don't know why, but I'm, you know, just making it up. But you could set certain defaults in there in your default constructor. Or you could simply just leave those, those uh, variables uh, blank, those instance variables blank. So you don't, so you don't need to actually declare a constructor or How does that work? <laughs> That's a great question. How does that work? How do constructors work as far as the default constructor? That's true. So in that, in that, that's true, but, but we're still missing a key point. If you had, for example, a three constructors, a one argument, a two argument, a three argument, then you called it, you know, and gave a one argument, it called the one argument constructor. You call it two, it called the two. You call three, you call three. But the question is, is what if I called it with no arguments? What would it call? Pardon me? In that case, you're going to get an error. And why would you get an error? Because if you don't provide an empty constructor, or a, a constructor with no parameters, if you, if you provide any other constructor other than one with no parameters, you can't use that default parameter. Right. In other words, it, you know, it, if you don't declare any constructors, a default constructor is created for you. All right. And that de default constructor simply creates the object and doesn't initialize any of the variables. All right. If you, you, if you create any other constructors on that, so if I create a one argument constructor or a one and a five argument constructor or whatever then, then the, the compiler says, hey, this guy knows what they're doing as far as constructors go. I'm not going to create a default one for him. So you get the default one for free, provided you don't put any of your own in. If you put any of your own in, they assume, hmm, maybe they don't want a default constructor. And then you would have to explicitly create a default constructor, with, or no argument constructor, rather, if you wanted the, the ability to create it without passing any parameters. Yeah, Let, let's, let's, let's create, uh, let's, cr yes, you get a compiler, all right. No, you wouldn't get an exception. Um, if I did this, if I had, let's say, a book constructor that accepted an author and a book constructor that accepted an author and a title, and I said b book b equals new book. I get a compile error saying there is no constructor with no arguments for book. All right. It would be the same as if I tried to say uh, pass five arguments in. There's no constructor that accepts five arguments. Well, there's no constructor that accepts no arguments. So therefore, I'd get a compile error. Mm -hmm. It's not going to create the default constructor. Well, if you don't have any it will if you don't have any. Right. It will run without an exception, but you're not, you're not knowing what you're going to get. Or well, I mean, it, it depends on you know, it depends on the specific um, the specific object. Yeah, um, it wouldn't initialize it to it, so it would depend on what the instance variables are. All right. If there were instance variables uh, that were integers. You know, by default, you create an integer. I, I'm pretty sure anyhow has a value of zero. You know, and so on. So, um, yeah, it would just it would be what it what it was, and you'd have to go in and, and manually go in and set that. Other questions about this? I go over this just to sort of depending on how often you use Java. You know, I, I know all of you have done it, but you know, it's good to to know this. Is is my belief 
you know, that you don't want to fight too many battles at the same time. You know, and therefore, let's review some of these Java concepts so that they're fresh in our mind so that we can just focus on the things uh, that we need to as far as this goes. Um, let's see. What else? What, what, what does static mean? What are static? What, what can be made static? And what does it mean if something is made static? Variables and methods can be made static. Yeah, that's typically what they're used for. That's not completely true, but that's one way, that, that's one thing that it's used for. Actually, that would be a static final, all right, would be, would be used for that. That word goes in memory? No. Well, well, um, no. Go ahead. That puts it out on the stack. That that makes it an instance of error. I'm sorry, a class variable as opposed right. to an instance variable. It's a class variable as opposed to an instance variable. So, for example, let's let's say I had a circle class. I could define a static variable, a static final for pi, right? Because pi is the same for every circle, and I wouldn't have to like have an instance variable for pi because it doesn't make sense to allow them to, to change pi for each circle. For this one, it's 3.14. For this one, it's 4. Uh, it doesn't make sense, right? Now, um, it could be a, a variable. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be final. But the idea is that there's only one of them per, uh, one of them per um, class, all right? For a static or a method, yeah, a static variable or a static method. The other thing is you you wouldn't need an instance then of of that class to to call the method. So if I had well, again, let's say I have my circle class and I had a, a static variable of pi. All right. I could say x equals circle dot pi times whatever. Static variables are maybe the one exception where it's okay to have them being public, right? Because you're using them like constants and, and it's okay to do that. I suppose you could instead, if you wanted to really be a purist, you could, you could make a method get pi and then have the get pi return the static. Uh, variable in there, you know, and then, then you could hold true to that. No, no. Uh, the, the static object is more or less what a class is, if you will. All right, it's a template, and, and there's only one of them per for every object. So yeah, it's yeah, or more or less. For example, like the math, the math functions. Yeah. Methods, right? Yeah, a lot of like the math functions. If you look, there's a math object, and there's math dot whatever, or like uh, the typical one when you're first writing Java uh, programs, you just want to output the value. You say system dot out dot println. And you capitalize system. That's sort of a tip off that that's a class, not a not an object. All right. I am very frustrated the way this machine is behaving, and I think I recovered. But uh, that really had me go. I was I was really very annoyed uh, with this, and and I will do my best to make sure stuff is is up and running for that. Um, what I would like to do then is. Um, let, let, let me finish up the formal part of the lecture, and then if you guys want to, we can go to lab. You both have laptops here if you'd prefer to work in here, um, or, you know, whatever. But I do want to review Angel with you and, and make sure everything is, make sure you know where everything is. Now, when did you sign up for the class? Yesterday. Yesterday. Um, it probably will show for you. I can let you log on and see. 
but I, I'll show you where the stuff is, and then if it, if it isn't today, check again tomorrow, and if it's not tomorrow, then, then send me an email. Okay. All right? So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's just to make sure you have the, the, the runtime environment and take some screen prints. Yeah. And if I bring a laptop, then I, I won't have to boot this uh, machine out the window. Okay. <laughs>